Saludos queridos amigos y muy bienvenidos a Missionali, donde estudiamos la Biblia, la vivimos y la compartimos con el mundo. Me llamo Roberto y hoy veremos que el estudio de la Biblia en español es una bendición tremenda. Hello dear friends and welcome to Missionali, where we study the Bible, we live it and we share it with the world. My name is Roberto and today we will see just what an amazing blessing it is to study the Bible in Spanish. You're going to really enjoy this, so stay with me. Now, before we get into this, let's learn just a little bit about the Spanish-speaking countries. There are 20 in particular. Mexico, six Central American countries, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama. Nine South American countries, Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, Chile, Paraguay, Uruguay, and Argentina. Three Caribbean countries, Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, and finally one European country, and that is Spain. Spanish is the national language in each of these countries, but according to Operation World, each country also contains numerous spoken dialects and languages. For example, in Mexico, which is the largest speaking country in the world, includes 297 different languages. Argentina has 40 and Spain has 21. Regarding religion, all of these countries have been and continue to be heavily influenced by Roman Catholicism although it is safe to say that most of it is cultural versus practical. For example, in Uruguay, 55% claim to be Catholics, but only 2.3% regularly attend Mass. In the Dominican Republic, nearly half of the Catholics are inactive, and others in the Church even claim to have no religion at all. Now, most of these countries claim to have freedom of religion, and by law they do, but not in practice there still exists significant oppression of those outside the Catholic Church, although this is going to vary by country. Now, another problem found in these countries is that there is a strong prevalence of syncretism, which simply means that even if someone converts to biblical Christianity, the new converts mix it with local pagan rituals and long-held superstitious beliefs. Now, let's briefly look at how the Spanish Bible came to be. During the 14th century, many people strongly desired to have a Bible written in Castilian Spanish, or Castellano. However, the Catholic Church was vehemently against any such endeavor, and it even went so far as to print an index, like a type of national decree, in 1551 and 1559 that forbade the printing of the Bible in any language except Hebrew, Greek, Latin, or Chaldean, which is a language similar to Aramaic that Jesus spoke. Now, during that time, the Spanish Inquisition was in full force, and in addition to the atrocities already committed, they also burned all the Bibles that they could find that were written in Spanish. Numerous men successfully completed portions of the Bible, as well as the New Testament in Spanish during the 16th century. But it wasn't until 1567 that Casiodoro de Reina completed a translation of the entire Bible in Spanish. This was later printed in Basel, Switzerland, in 1569. Now, another man who was a gifted translator and editor, Cipriano de Valera, worked for 20 years on revising Casiodoro's work, and in 1602, his edition was complete. Now, unfortunately, both of these editions contained what is called the Apocryphal, uh, which are uninspired books of the Bible, because in their time, it was actually illegal to print any Bible without these books. In the years and centuries that followed, other translations emerged. Today, the most popular Spanish Bible appears to be the Reina Valera 1960 version. However, I'm not a huge fan of it, simply because it uses an older Spanish in the vosotros form, which is the second person plural, and it's a bit difficult to understand, especially if you're not from Spain. Now, the majority of Latin America uses the ustedes verb form, which is the third person plural. And this is what the newer, more modern Spanish Bibles are using, and I think it makes them just a bit easier to read, in my humble opinion. Now, the Reina Valera continues to be improved and revised, and I believe the latest revision happened in 2020, and it was recently presented in Madrid, Spain, 
by the Spanish Bible Society. Before I continue, let me say that I don't want to take anything away from Reina and Valera. They work with the resources they had at the time and they set the standard. However, due to a greater number of manuscripts and archaeological findings, there now exist stronger and more accurate translations. Personally, I use the NBLA, La Nueva Biblia de las Américas, which I believe to be a very strong, accurate, and faithful translation. Now, study Bibles of the NBLA by Dr. John MacArthur and Dr. Albert Moeller are set to arrive in the next few months. I'll leave a link below to both of these works. I have the amazing fortune of being born in the United States. However, both of my parents are from Jalisco, Mexico. So I was raised in a household that spoke Spanish on a regular basis. Plus, my wife is from Mexico City, so I have been surrounded by this beautiful language for most of my life. Now, when I read the Bible in Spanish, I feel that it connects me with my family and cultural roots in a way that only God can achieve. Now, let's actually get into the Bible and look at how Spanish uses certain words to make the meaning of a verse more colorful versus its English counterpart. I have two in particular that I'd like to share. The first one is Ephesians 5, verse 11. Y no participen en las obras estériles de las tinieblas, sino más bien desenmascarenlas. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Let's look at the first example. Instead of the word unfruitful, Spanish uses the word estériles, which means sterile. I see unfruitful as describing an activity that will produce nothing of value. Something sterile can't produce anything at all, so I see this as an even stronger word. A sterile activity, then, is something that is completely in vain, a true waste of time. Can you say the same thing about unfruitful? I suppose you can, and perhaps it's just semantics on my part, but at least for me, the meaning of sterile makes this verse clearer and easier to understand. Now, let's look at the second part of this. Instead of the word expose, Spanish uses the word desenmascarenlas, which means to unmask. The original word in Greek means to expose, reprove, and convict. So in essence, what we are to do is expose the falsehood of something so that the incorrect teaching may be reproved and the person spreading the lie may be convicted of the truth. To remove the mask of falsehood, as noted in Spanish, is simply a more colorful way, I believe, to describe the same action. Now, let's go to the second and final verse. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55. Donde está, o oh muerte, tu victoria? Donde, o oh sepulcro, tu aguijón? O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? In this example, the English version uses the word death twice which is what the original word in Greek actually translates into. The Spanish word muerte means death. The second reference to death, though, uses the word sepulcro, which means tomb. This word, I personally believe, brings a more vivid picture to mind because you can actually visualize a tombstone with a name on it. But because Jesus conquered the grave, the tomb is actually empty, and so it will be, dear friends, when our time comes. Neither death nor the tomb has any power over us, thanks to the Lamb of God, whose presence we, as true believers, will enjoy at His Supper. Amen. Let me end with La Bendición Arónica, the Aaronic blessing found in Numbers 6, verses 24 to 26. El Señor te bendiga y te guarde. El Señor haga resplandecer su rostro sobre ti y tenga de ti misericordia. El Señor alce sobre ti su rostro y te dé paz. Amén. Dios les bendiga, queridos amigos, y si el Señor nos da licencia, los veré en el próximo video.